Hello, and welcome to New America for our second annual collaboration with Outen National Security to roll out and celebrate their Leaders in New Voices list. Um, we're all hopeful that maybe this is the last time we have to do this only virtually, but nonetheless, we're thrilled to welcome so many of you virtually as we celebrate honorees currently serving in government, the military, thinks tanks, academia, and non-governmental organizations, and celebrate a partnership and out in national security's leadership in making sure that those who lead the nation look like those they're sworn to serve and that both the who and the what of national security policy expand to represent this whole great nation of ours. Um, as we hear from today's honorees and our special guest, Representative Alyssa Slotkin, you might also like to check out um, on social media our Looking Like America campaign, where you'll see some of this year's honorees, some of last year's honorees, some of out in national security's founders who have been called to serve in the new administration in various roles in a really unprecedented show of openness and um, progress on, on exactly the issues that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, but first, before we hear from some of our honorees, we will hear from Representative Slacken in a conversation moderated by one of this year's honorees, Laura Thomas. Um, Representative Slacken really needs no introduction. Laura's gonna give her one, but we are thrilled um, to have her here in her championship of American democracy, sensible national security policy, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Laura Thomas is the Senior Director of National Security Solutions for um, Cold Quanta. And she's also a former Central Intelligence Agency case officer and chief of base, which for 16 years gave her service in national security and leadership roles across the US intelligence community, including the National Security Council, Department of State, Department of Defense, US Congress, and foreign partners. So I really couldn't ask for two better folks to kick off um, both the, the breadth and depth of how this community is really changing and opening up opportunities for what national security looks like and how we do it better. So Laura, over to you. Thank you so much, Heather, for that introduction on behalf of New America. It's really my pleasure to be here today as your host to celebrate our 2021 out in national security list. In addition to our out leaders, today we will have a discussion with someone who has had a number of national security career path changes, but certainly no change in mission. And that mission is to ensure that the security of all Americans and that we all feel safe in our communities just as we are. I am thrilled to introduce Michigan's eighth congressional district representative, Alyssa Slotkin. Representative Slotkin and I share common background at CIA, and she took that role to even more impactful levels. Now in Congress for a second term, she is the chairwoman of the Intelligence and Counterterrorism Subcommittee within the House Committee on Homeland Security, and also sits on the House Armed Services and Veterans Affairs Committees. Prior to representing Michigan's 8th District, she served three tours in Iraq, and she's also held roles at the White House, DNI, and the Pentagon. Representative Slotkin, thank you so much for being here with us today. As a national security veteran and leader, we would love to hear what it means to you to speak to those of us out in national security. Absolutely. Thank you, Laura. Um, and um, it is nice to be with my national security peeps. Um, and uh, I always um, um, enjoy talking with folks who are in the thick of it in the national security world because our work is so, so important. And I want to thank Luke, who I know is somewhere in the audience there, um, who co-founded, um, you know, and is now president of Out in National Security. There he is. And um, in particular for helping to get me here and reaching out, happy to always do that. Um, and then I will start by wishing everyone a happy pride. Um, and the good news is um, COVID is like just getting to a place where we can actually start having some real pride events. I'm excited because this weekend um, we are doing our first big pride event in the district um, that doesn't have to be virtual. We can be out together. Um, and uh, um, um, it's just, that's how it should be. So I'm glad we're getting back to that. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that, um, when I first started running for office, um, maybe a lot of my national security people that I'd worked with for 15 years 
um, had never known um, was that um, I grew up in a gay home. Um, my parents divorced in the 80s um, when I was a little girl and um, my mom, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say she came out in suburban Detroit in 1986. Um, they divorced because she was gay and um, frankly, it was, a, it was not a time that was hip to be gay in suburban Detroit. So there wasn't like a big coming out party. It was just something that was kind of whispered in the corners, quiet, um, and not something that was discussed. Um, but because of um, her decision and, and my brother and I living with her, um, we ended up really just growing up in the gay community of suburban Detroit. Um, and when you grew up in the gay community, um, in the late 80s, um, then you were dealing with um, the HIV AIDS crisis. And, you know, when I, I get asked this question as an elected official now, like, how did you become political? When was the first time you thought about political things or, or you thought about running or those kinds of things? I, I never thought about those questions before. And when I really look back on it, it was 100% the AIDS crisis. And the fact that at that time, um, you know, my parent, my dad a, was a good Reagan Republican and I loved my dad. And so that's who I voted for in all my student elections. Um, but I remember that Ronald Reagan would not say the word AIDS and the protest movement, all the awakening that was going on in the gay community around just trying to save their lives. Um, that was something that I got swept up in as a middle schooler. You know, and um, I think that it has informed so much of how I think about, um, frankly, the government, which is we have the capacity to do important, critical things every single day. We protect people, but it is not perfect and it needs constant pushing and oversight in order to be the government that we all want. And I think you guys um, embody that, right? Um, you're, you're, you're people who have been either in um, or in or out of government and you care deeply about your country and you want it to be the place that we know it can be, which is accepting of all people. Um, and um, so that was my formative sort of moment where I really was like, wait a minute, um, my government isn't doing the right thing and that's a problem. Um, obviously, um, um, I was deeply affected by the loss of a lot of my mom's closest friends um, and um, it's still, uh, my mom was very, very um, involved in a lot of um, uh, AIDS organizations, nonprofits. So I just sort of grew up in that world. Um, um, but to be honest, um, I think people are still surprised when they see, you know, someone who has a CIA and Defense Department background, who obviously cares deeply about protecting the country, but also grew up in a, in a gay home. Um, and the good news is, like, I'm not that abnormal anymore. Right, it's starting to not be anom an anomaly, and I'm sure many of you who are watching, um, you know, have children, and they're going to be able to say, you know, my parent was uh, an LGBTQ uh, national security person. It's going to become normal, um, and um, that's a great, great thing because, um, especially as someone who was in the executive branch and now is in the legislative branch, um, I see how easy it is for people working their careers in government to get siloed off from the sentiment of the people, from the movement and development of social movements, from um, the kind of latest thing that the American people are, are focused on and worried about. Um, and I think um, you all have a really important role to play in bringing the government along with the nation that they represent. Um, and um, I'm thrilled uh, to be speaking to you all and I'm thrilled to help in that mission. Um, and uh, lastly, I will just say, um, you know, um, uh, there is obviously, there are many aspects to our government and national security profession being inclusive, to our country being inclusive. Some of it is the attitudes of our peers um, and the relationship that we have with those who we serve alongside of, but some of it is just straight up um, laws and protections. And um, we need to make progress on both. And my mom passed away in 2011 um, and she never got to see marriage equality. You know, she, she died of ovarian cancer um, 
and had a long-term partner, a six-year partner who was by her side the entire time. And I always think about um, how the only reason that my mom's partner, Annie, was allowed um, to be in the room with her in the hospital, to visit her in the ICU when she was her most sick, to make decisions on her behalf, on her care, um, was be just out of the good graces of the nurses and doctors in that hospital. There was no protections. They were not legally married. Um, and I think about what it would have been like if um, those people in that hospital had only um, gone by the letter of the law. Um, and so while we were thrilled that we had doctors and nurses who supported us and who were open-minded enough to understand, we cannot rely on that. That is not enough. We need legal protection under law. And um, I think the fight that is uh, that we all want to sort of be a part of is on two tracks. Um, and neither track can be ignored, right? It's, it's talking to our peers and our kids and the teachers and everybody to make sure there's acceptance, but it's also getting things nailed down in law. And one of the things I'm thrilled to be able to do is now be on the legislative side where we can do that, where we can do that, especially in a place like the House Armed Services Committee that lays down all the rules for the US military. Um, because as we know, when the military starts to make changes, um, that's when the rest of society sometimes catches up. So in any case, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you for caring about this issue because it's for you, but it's for so many other people. So thanks so much. Thank you, Representative Slotkin, for those very powerful comments. Um, you know, culture doesn't necessarily change overnight, but laws can. So we're very appreciative that, that you're there representing us. Um, I'd like to start off with one question and then we'll take some from the audience. You've said in past speeches that our single greatest national security threat is our own internal division here at home. We know foreign powers are trying to inflame culture wars and you know, attempt to use support for the LGBTQ plus community as a point of division for Americans. How do you think we should tackle this as a nation? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, uh because uh, definitely, I mean, I think, yes, of course, we have foreign actors exploiting um, uh, these issues um, from abroad to divide Americans as a tactic to keep us busy so that we're not focused on places like Russia or China or anywhere else. Um, but the truth is, lately, I mean, they're pushing on an open door for a lot of this stuff. You know, it's not like the foreign actors are the most concerning actors when it comes to things like culture war around LGBTQ issues. Um, and if you watch you know, certain TV stations or news outlets right now, it's like hours and hours and hours a day on kind of culture war issues that make people think that you know, there's something scary coming for their kids or the, you know, that kind of thing. Um, um, I think the most important thing, because I, I come from a district that is, that is often grappling with these issues. The most important thing that I've seen, and I guess I've just seen it also with my, my, my own family, is the importance of visibility for the LGBTQ community in all aspects of life so that people have a personal connection to someone who is gay. Like it, it really is um, the best way to dispel this idea that it's it's something other, it's scary, it's not me, it's, it's, you know, it is, you know, and I think about it, I have relatives who, you know, um, were homophobic until their best friend's son came out and they were invited to the wedding and they had to grapple with like, how could I not go to the wedding of someone who I watched grow up? And they pushed through and, you know, I hear that same cousin bragging about how they went to a gay wedding and how, I mean, Great, you know what I mean? It, but it's personal connection. We cannot forget that. That's why being visible is so important. That's why I know it's controversial, but like gay pride flags in our shopping malls, it may be the commercialization of gay pride, but it's also a way to ha have visibility in communities that would never otherwise have that visibility. So um, I think that's number one. And then number two, um, we just have to be vigilant about um, uh, uh, and call a spade a spade. If you see something that is homophobic, we need to call it out. We need to be vocal about it and not sweep it under the rug. 
Um, and that includes in media and that includes from our local officials. Like we have to start demanding equality at every level. And, um, you know, we saw this with racism as well. A lot of people kind of pretended not to hear, you know, allies pretended not to hear for many years when they were in line at the grocery store. And now, especially after last summer, that's not okay to just pretend you didn't hear. So I think a lot of it is personal um, on top of um, being vigilant in law and in legislation. Great, thank you. I, certainly some of what you just said resonated with me with you know, my own family and grappling with attending uh, the wedding for me and my wife. Um, I wanna make sure the audience knows, please, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We're, we're going to try to get through as many as we can. Um, I'll move on to a second question. Yeah. You have spoken in the past about, you know, government can't solve all of our problems, but it can provide clarity of vision and a roadmap for solutions. You know, specifically on national security threats, you know, what do you think is the, the second threat that you would be looking at as a major priority and, and how would you tackle it? You know, what's the roadmap? You said the second threat, is that what you said? Yeah, we've, we've talked about internal divisions oh, being yeah. the first, what would your second be? So I gotta tell you, um, I don't know if it's because of recent events on cyber attacks, but like it, the threat of uh, on cybersecurity and cyber attacks has like seeped into the bloodstream in American society because they went after our gas, they went after our hot dogs, they went after our video games. Like I was with the Secretary of Agriculture and we did an open Q and A with a bunch of farmers in my district last week, and like you know to see a family farmer say like okay, open Q&A, what are you worried about? And he's like, cybersecurity. I mean, it has gotten down into the meat of society, right? So, and we don't have doctrine around cybersecurity. You know, we don't have a playbook the way we do on a traditional conventional military threat. Um, and that is on display. We saw yesterday with the summit, right? It's, what do we do when our pipelines are attacked? What do we do if our electrical grid is attacked in Michigan in February? and 24 elderly people freeze to death in their homes. What's the proportionate response when that happens? How do we hold people accountable? And I think the younger national security people on uh, professionals on this, you know, on the Zoom, we're gonna really need your help in understanding how to think through doctrine. And because we don't have it, we don't have deterrence. It's literally like open season, right? And um, I have little, like, town mayors coming to me being like, my town is 2000 people, but I have all their personal data and I don't know the first thing about securing it. What should I do? So I think cybersecurity is way up there as um, not only a really serious threat, but also one we don't have a great answer for. And um, the best, I mean, literally I was having substantive conversations today in terms of government trying to light the path um, I think we need to start treating cybersecurity like arms control. We need to start having formalized carrots and sticks in a, in a formal diplomatic process that holds countries accountable if bad actors are acting on their behalf or from their soil. Um, so I would put cyber right up there uh, at number two. Great, thank you. Could you share maybe a, a story or something that you learned or experienced while serving overseas in Iraq that has really shaped your view of, of our government or things that you've um, sort of lessons that you go back to and, and it's given you insight and principles into how you operate today? Well, listen, there are a lot of good examples and bad examples that I learned from my three tours in Iraq. Um, um, the the um, uh, the positive, the thing that I felt most acutely when I was in Baghdad was all the government agencies were basically in one place, right? The green zone. That was where my first tour was. And man, when we work abroad, the U.S. government can coordinate easily. We are on the same page. There's none of that bureaucratic infighting. There's none of that, like, takes 12 weeks to get a memo signed. Like, it works. Um, and then I would come back to Washington and like want to be pulling my hair out for how long things took, right? And how how political and, and controversial they got when you just weren't sitting in the same room with someone. So that lesson I brought with me a lot that like 
You know, if my team here comes in and they're like, well, we're getting some weird vibes from another, you know, office on the Hill or from, I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call the, the member and 99 times out of a hundred, it's just static. It's a game of telephone and static that's created when people get their backs up. So um, that's a good, good lesson I learned from um, being under the same roof in, in Baghdad. Um, obviously, I mean, the most profound lesson I learned from Iraq was like, we had a failing strategy for many, many years and we knew it. Those of us on the ground knew it and we couldn't break through for the decision makers in Washington to hear it because they were invested in that strategy. Very important lesson for all of us at every level, right? If you double down on your strategy and you're unwilling to take feedback, negative feedback on it, and you're, un and you're so dug in that you're blinded, um, it has significant consequences. And that matters, of course, if you're going into a war, but on a million other things that we all work on every single day. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a question from the audience from Teresa. What appetite is there in the house to codify into law the protection of transgender individuals being able to serve in the military? Um, so um, that I don't think that would be a problem in the house. Um, it's the Senate. I mean, this is not this is not going to be new to anyone, but um, you know, because of the sixty vote threshold um, in the Senate, um, many many things that we have and will vote on in the House will never get an up or down vote in the Senate. Um, now, to be honest, um, I'm for putting it all up and then having people be on record, right? It, I I don't I don't love this idea that we only put votes up when they can pass. I want to know. I want to know who's going to vote against um, uh, an all military force having um, uh, transgender folks serve their country. I, I, I want that. I want to know. Right. Don't let them hide by saying it never came up. So um, in the House, you, you, that wouldn't that wouldn't be a problem. Um, uh, that and many, many other things. I think uh, the Senate is where it won't uh, get the light of day. OK. I think we have time for probably one more question, and this is from Nathan. What are your thoughts about how we think about LGBTQ rights abroad and our own foreign policy? Hmm. Well, I know that we have certainly done some major pendulum swinging from uh, the Obama administration to the Trump administration, Trump administration, and now the beginning of the Biden administration on, uh, on, um, on basically, it, I'd call the category um, like how our internal debates in the United States play out in our foreign aid and foreign assistance um, packages. And we see this on a ton of issues. LGBTQ issues, of course, issue the issue of abortion. Um, uh, a whole bunch of uh, the issue of immigration plays out in our foreign policy. Like all the internal fights that go on within the country play out in our foreign aid packages. Um, I, I think that um, a lot of the Trump era changes are being um, examined in the departments of agency and departments and agencies and are being reversed if they were um, put in place. And I know that Secretary Blinken over the State Department and over at USAID, they are looking pretty hard at what um, social issues affected the Trump administration aid packages and making sure that we reverse all of those things. Again, in the House and my peers who are on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, they are extremely supportive of making sure that, um, that monies that we um, send abroad are, um, are not discriminatory um, uh, in a way that we just wouldn't accept on the domestic side. Great. Well, thank you, Representative Slotkin, on behalf of all of us here today, your time, your support of our communities, both LGBTQ plus communities and certainly national security community as well. Of course, happy to do it. Thank you for what you're doing, for caring about our country, for caring about bringing all voices to our national security. It's an awesome thing. Um, and let me know how I can help, okay? Great, thank Have you. Have a good one. Bye guys. You too. All right, uh, I'd now like to call on Luke. He's going to speak a bit more about out in national security and this year's honorees. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, many of you have seen us on Twitter and we've been around for a couple of years. 
uh, my colleagues from the Obama administration, Rusty Pickens and Sean Skelly, uh, set up out in national security shortly after the end of the administration because the US national security apparatus is the single largest employer of LGBTQ Americans and through the VA, one of the single largest benefits and medical providers to LGBTQ Americans. We took the view that even though it was less than 10 years after Don't Ask, Don't Tell had been repealed and the trans ban was being unrepealed and re-implemented by the Trump administration, that we needed to fill the gap and bridge between traditional LGBT advocacy and the national security apparatus, which directly employs roughly a quarter million gay people in Active Garden Reserve and beyond. Uh, we had hoped originally that we would be met with a friendly administration that would offer, you know, ways through, and instead we spent a couple of years playing defense against the Trump administration. Our core goals have always been to recruit, retain, and promote more queer people in the space, uh, to reach out and connect to the hundreds of ERGs, and to make ourselves more visible. And that means public education, which is why I talk to the Hill, it's why I, you've seen me publish articles, it's also why we do the list. Uh, we are just over a generation after the point at which it was illegal to be openly queer and hold a clearance. And there's work to do going backwards, the Love Act, and there's work to do going forwards about how we get to show up in the national security apparatus. And that is persuading our many straight friends and allies to do the work institutionally and culturally to make the world a better place. For the community, we set up the list so people in our community and our allies could see us and understand that we're valuable professionals. And so many of the young queer people who want to come into this space and serve their country could see us as well, whether or not that is more senior people like our friend Josh Black, who's now advising Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, but began his career concealing his identity while serving as an FSO in Kosovo, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Jesse Salazar, uh, and Lindsay Church, who founded Minority Veterans to make sure that minority vets get a seat at the table, who's done remarkable work over the last couple of years. I'm unbelievably excited to share with the world our new voices, including ROTC cadet James Wong, uh, Leif Swindon, who's an FSO, and Teresa Kennedy, who is a U.S. Navy civilian, each of whom demonstrate not only tremendous caliber and tremendous progress, but the breadth and depth of our community going forward. Uh, we, would, we thought it would be great to conclude the program by hearing from some of our honorees themselves and hear a bit about how they've reflected on their applications. So let me hand it back to you, Laura. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna go through and ask a few different people on what it means to them to be out and also some advice that they have received from mentors. So we're going to kick it off with Alexandra McCargo, who is president and CEO of Precision Collective and a member of Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. Alex, what does it mean for you to be out? Hi, <clears throat> thank you everyone. So as an intersectional person, right, as a woman, as a black woman, as a queer black woman, being out has so many different layers, right? There are components of your life that you're that are very obvious, right? I'm a woman, right? I, it is obvious I am black, right? I'm a person of color. But to bring my full identity to work is something that can't be understated, right? To be able to participate in water cooler conversations or to interject all anecdotes and, and all parts of my personality, all parts of my personhood into my job with, with interactions with my colleagues and all of those pieces can't be, um, there, there's no better feeling, right? To know that there's no part of you hiding, but, but conversely, as I do my job, everyone that is hiding a piece of their, their identity, that's an additional step that you're taking in order to really provide the best advice, provide the best services, whatever your whatever part that you're that, that you play in this kind of grand scheme. And as long as we continue to have people unable to, to show their true selves, we're not getting everyone's best, right? So, so for me to be out and to be out in this space is just that freedom. I mean, I went back through and I saw some of the other um, some of the other folks that are here with me and their responses. And, and I, I feel like that thread was, was really spun through all of our responses, it's, it's the freedom. It's the ability to not be concerned, not be worried, not have that you know looming cloud over your shoulders. So um, to be out is, is freedom for me. 
Thank you. All right, thank you, Alex. All right, next up is Ari Shaw, who's the Director of International Programs at UCLA's Williams Institute. Ari, what does it mean to you to be out? Still muted, sorry about that. Hi. Thanks, Laura. Um, and thank you to ONS New America for this really wonderful honor um, and the opportunity to join uh, such incredible colleagues today. You know, I was really fortunate to come out to a family that was incredibly supportive and created a solid sort of personal foundation um, for uh, coming out and, and my health and well-being. But professionally, I didn't start my career with a highly visible set of um, out mentors who, who demonstrated that it was possible to be queer and successful in foreign policy and national security. And while I wasn't personally in the military, I feel like I still had a sense that the foreign policy in that set world was defined by don't ask, don't tell. And that my impression was that being gay was at best tolerated if unacknowledged. Um, and at worst, it was stigmatizing and, and even career ending. So for me, being out means at a basic level that I'm visible to my colleagues, to family and friends, and even to people who I may never meet. Um, it enables me to assert that queer people and queer experiences exist where I move through the world um, and you know, in the sort of foreign policy and academic spaces where I've worked. And it also means that I can perhaps in a small way be a model for people who may still be closeted or at the beginning of their careers and show that it, it is possible to um, succeed and be true to yourself. And for me, being out also means that I am able to more fully integrate my uh, commitment to LGBTQ rights into my professional life and work. Um, I wish that I had known early on that focusing specifically on LGBTQ human rights wouldn't constrain me professionally or stifle opportunities, which really was a lot of the advice that I was given early on. Um, and instead, I've, I've found that actually viewing the world through the experiences of marginalized groups has been an asset um, and enhances my ability to see complexity and intersections across global issues and really empathize with um, diverse communities. And I think that can add value to debates, not despite my queerness, but because of it. Um, so being out allows me to do that work um, that I'm currently engaged in in an authentic way um, without being afraid of um, stigma. So I'm really grateful to organizations like ONS New America that are, that are leading the way in shaping this sort of inclusive work culture and um, creating communities in, in the foreign policy and that set spaces for LGBTQ people. Great, thank you so much, Ari. Next, we have Taylor Westfall, a civil servant at the State Department who has also worked tirelessly for GLIPA, which represents and advocates for LGBTQ plus members of the State Department community. Taylor, what does it mean to you to be out? Thank you so much. And thank you to Ari and Alex uh, for your words too. When I first learned about out uh, in national security, my boss now um, was on the first list and he encouraged me to apply. And I think the first thing I felt was like insecurity about, you know, is that something that I'm even qualified for? And I think when I thought about it, what it means to be out, it's just joy, you know, kind of as Alex was saying, I've gone through periods of life where I've been more in a closet and more out and proud. And I think when I am reflecting back on my career, uh, being out has brought me incredible professional and personal success. Um, I, I joined this job and speaking to Ari, my, my work completely intersects with this. I work on human rights, covering the LGBT portfolio for State Department um, international organizations. What a beautiful marriage of things. Um, I'm working on the first ever US sponsored side event at the Human Rights Council right now, specifically around transgender rights. Um, being able to spend all day advocating for people in the LGBT community while also feeling this like deep personal um, identity and, and sense of worth is so incredible. Uh, within the last year, I got engaged and married. My wife, I think, is listening in. And being able to share that with colleagues and have their blessing, um, having some of them watch my Zoom wedding and feeling that like love and support um, has meant everything. And I think, I wish I had also known um, earlier on that 
being your true self, bringing that, it's really non-negotiable as you continue. Um, it takes so much energy to not be who you are. Um, and I just, I wish, you know, as we talk to Glyph, I have lots of, of young mentors, I have college kids and, and they're like, what is it like? Is it scary? And I, and I constantly tell them, I mean, right, there's so many different global contexts, but on a day-to-day, -day, it's joyous. It's wonderful to be who you are and to be proud and to, um, and to be that role model for other people. And I obviously wanna thank my, my Glyfa colleagues for sort of shepherding me through this process over the last year in the affinity group um, and thank the mentor. Wes Reiser was on the first list and he's now um, my deputy director. Um, so the leadership of those who've come before us has made such a difference. And thank you so much. I'm so honored to be, uh, to be on the, this list with so many of you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Taylor. Uh, now I'm going to ask a bit about what folks have learned from mentors, because we know that mentorship is, is so important to our community. And I'm going to start with Paul Angelo, veteran who now is a Latin America expert at the Council on Foreign Relations. Paul, what's the best advice you ever received from a mentor and how have you incorporated it? Thanks, Laura. And I, I wanna thank ONS and New America for this distinction. I'm really touched and honored by my inclusion on, on this list with so many people that I admire and so many friends and I look forward to getting to know the rest of you that I don't know uh, in the months and years to come. Uh, as for the piece of advice that has most influenced my professional trajectory, it uh, is don't back somebody into a corner without giving them a way out. Early in my career, I possessed uh, an extra healthy dose of confidence. And in many ways, I suspect it was my way of compensating for my sexuality, which at the time was a secret to everyone because of don't ask, don't tell. And so um, I think that that scenario made me fairly assertive when it came to defending my ideas and ways of doing things in the workplace. I was very much a results oriented person, but what I failed to recognize in being that way was that when you're working on a team, the process is sometimes just as important as the result. And when you're working on a team, the process itself should never alienate the people who make up the team. And as a young Navy Lieutenant, I was a liaison to the Colombian military and a mentor of mine at the time was an Army Lieutenant Colonel. And he ingrained in me a real respect for the process, something that was later reiterated while I was working for the State Department. For those of you who know the State Department, well, you also recognize that it's a, a process oriented organization. Uh, and so I had a particularly prickly relationship with my Colombian counterpart, somebody that I had to work with uh, on a daily basis. And even though we were working towards the same goals, there were times in which he would keep information from me to make me look bad in front of my boss and in front of his boss. And so I consulted my mentor about how to deal with the situation. And his message is the motto by which I have lived in the workplace ever since. Never back somebody into a corner without giving them a way out. Even if I wasn't afforded that same respect from my counterpart, I was going uh, to avoid the temptation to fight fire with fire. And so I would say, of course, it's very satisfying to be right about something. But I would never let that kind of smugness, smugness jeopardize the professional relationships that I depend on to accomplish a mission. And I've always looked for ways in the workplace to lower the temperature of disagreement by giving people opportunities to save face when they're wrong. This helps preserve rapport, earn respect, but also get the job done. People will always remember being embarrassed or feeling alienated by you, and that will come back to haunt you sooner or later. So if it's avoidable, and most of the time it is, uh, it's best not to do it. So never back somebody into a corner without giving them a way out. Great. Thank you, Paul. Wonderful advice. So second is Shani Chanda, one of our new voices who works for the Bangladesh Environment and Development Society. What's the best advice that you've received from a mentor and how have you incorporated it? Thank you, Lauren, again. <clears throat> thank you to ONS and New America for having this event and for recognizing us. It's really been an honor for me, and I hope um, I look forward to, to meeting new friends, as, as Paula said. Um, for, for me, particularly what I put down um, during the application process was this idea that I had learned um, from actually both my father and from certain mentors in my life about um, how you yourself are your own harshest critic. So you will judge yourself more than anyone else will ever judge you. And I think this is some somewhat of a, a shared experience even for folks that have been in the closet because when you have that anxiety that people are gonna catch you in a lie, it's like you believe that everything that you do is extra visible, right? So I know that when I first entered the workplace, I was really nervous that because I didn't feel like I wanted to wear skirts or, um, or high heels or really dress 
sort of in the way that most women in the office were dressing, that that would say something about me, that everyone would know, and therefore they would judge me. Um, and that, you know, lended to, oh, well, maybe they'll judge my ideas, or maybe they'll judge my work, or just always sort of putting myself in this box that I felt like I couldn't escape from. And so it took, you know, a few pushes for myself to think about it in the sense that when somebody else slips up, if somebody else walks in <clears throat> in flats and, and a pantsuit, I am not going to think twice about that, right? Like I wouldn't judge anyone else for that. And so there's no reason for me to believe that everybody in the world is watching me. And that's helped me, I think, cal be calm and be able to present my own ideas and really believe that they have merit in these kinds of situations and have faith in myself um, and just know that, you know, at the end of the day, I am going to be the hardest on myself. And if that's just the truth of it, then maybe I should not be <laughs> because there's no reason to be. So, um, that was something that, yeah, I've, I've definitely learned from my father, um, as well as different mentors in my life who just, um, have pushed me to sort of embrace who I am and, and the ideas that I have. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Ashani. All right, next is Timmy Fitzgerald, an active duty Naval officer who is training to be a foreign area officer. Timmy, what's the best advice you received from a mentor and how have you incorporated it? Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I head to Saudi Arabia in the fall for my next assignment to work as a senior Naval advisor for the US military training mission in CENTCOM, working with the Eastern Naval Fleet of Saudi Arabia. And it's been such a pleasure talking with many of you about the upcoming challenges I may face over there in this role. Um, the best leadership advice I received can be summed up into two words, people matter. In the Navy, we tend to forget that. We tend to be consumed with our own achievements, our own issues, and we forget as leaders that we need to be supportive of the people we lead. So my anecdote starts while I was serving on board my first ship in Yokosuka, Japan. I reported on board and we got underway for about a year without returning to Yokosuka. Uh, during the middle of month eight, I would say, I was getting a little worn down. I hardly slept. I felt like I was always on watch and I began to feel my bright shining attitude shifting into a, a darker ether, so to speak. Uh, I was lucky to serve with a phenomenal senior chief. He called it like it was. He and I did not see eye to eye all the time. And our first few months together were rather tumultuous. Kind of sounds like Paul and we could probably say the same uh, same stories. I was a stubborn junior officer and thought I knew everything. So I remember one evening after a long watch on the bridge where we were playing the role of plane guard, which sounds cool, but it's really not. This is where you trail a carrier by about a thousand yards and their aircraft use your ship as a vantage point to land on the carrier at night. And uh, we are sometimes also the first to respond if a plane misses the carrier and lands in the water. It can be stressful because the carrier will give you their proposed position and your goal as the ship driver is to not cross the path of the carrier. So this particular night, I remember I performed rather poorly where I almost got our ship T-boned by the carrier, but I digress and that is a much longer story. So I get off the bridge and I pass my senior chief in the P-way. I was on edge and he said something to me as I was walking past about a weapon system I own that just went down. I was about to say something very smart alecky and he yanked me into one of the engineering rooms nearby and he looked at me and he said, uh, with many more expletives that I can say here, Fitz, pick yourself up. Stop moping around looking all mad your sailors look at look up to you, and when they see you like this, you begin to lose their respect. And I was thinking, senior, it's 2 a.m. in the morning. No one will see me, but I was wrong. Uh, about a couple seconds later, I ran into one of my sailors who was also having a terrible night. Instead of brushing past them angrily, I was able to put aside my own emotions, took that sailor to the galley, and sat and talked with her for about an hour about what was causing stress in her life. She had no idea what my night had been like because I was able to take a deep breath and remember my position on this ship. And I was able to step up and be a leader when needed. Had she seen me indignantly marching down the P-way, she would never have stopped me. And I would never have realized that she needed someone to talk to. So from that day on, I always remembered that my exterior attitude mattered. At my exterior attitude matters. Uh, life will throw you curveballs. And sometimes you just need to take a deep breath, keep moving forward in a positive direction, and always remember that people matter. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And I truly feel so grateful to be among such phenomenal human beings on this list. Great, thank you so much, Timmy. Or maybe we should call you Fitz from now on after that story. Uh, finally, Heather Regan, a longtime State Department hand who is currently a program examiner at OMB. What's the best advice you've ever received from a mentor and how have you incorporated it? Thank you so much, Laura. Um, and this is all really excellent advice. I um, am honored to be among all of you. Uh, I think really the best advice that I got um, 
earlier on in my career came as, as a surprise. Um, I was working at the time uh, and had the joy to work with Outright Action International in 2018. They are an international NGO that um, works on LGBTIQ issues globally. And I was working under United Nations Program Director Siri May at the time. Um, and I was really doing functional work that I loved at Outright. I was convening with diplomats, writing policy strategy, um, and in a way that felt very freeing because it was in the NGO space. We were able to push in a way that often you can't push uh, as a US delegate. Um, and able to kind of work for more progressive ideas there. And at the end of my time with Outright, I told Siri um, just how much I was enjoying my time in the advocacy and NGO space, and that I was thinking of pivoting my career because of her mentorship and her work and my time with everyone at Outright. Um, Outright was actually the first and the only place so far in my career that I was working with uh, entirely queer and trans people. And it was really an incredible comfort because we could get to the work without explaining anything about ourselves and really without explaining why this was important to each other, right? And so it felt like we could really get into it. Um, and I, I assumed that Siri would encourage me to continue down this path to join international advocacy efforts. And it, she surprised me by really working hard to dissuade me. Um, I had joined outright knowing that I you know, was, was hoping to uh, continue my passion within the US government. And she, she urged me to follow that passion um, by saying really that meaningful change you know, can be made from the outside of government. And that's what I was, was seeing in the NGO space, but that sometimes even greater impact can uh, happen when you when you bring your entire self to established policy spaces. Um, and I am really thankful for Representative Slotkin for speaking to us and, you know, and saying that the United States government is not perfect, but this is why we need to be here and we need to be able to push um, from the inside and to be our full selves from the inside. So I've been, you know, really honored to be able to work, um, you know, in the White House Office of Management and Budget. I have been able to have the pen on and, and give edits to really meaningful and impactful executive orders um, and do policy work that I might not have been able to do from the advocacy space. Uh, Siri at Outright was, was really the first queer femme role model that I had. So I, I took her words to heart. Um, and you know, it, it's this importance of figuring out where the intersection of your identity, um, your abilities and also the methods for affecting and enacting change all align. So if you are a person who has the aptitude and ability and desire to work from within the government space, you really should because we need each other. Um, and, you know, it can be hard to work in established policy spaces. I am not working amongst all queer and trans people um, at OMB and at state, but uh, the more that we have forums like this and we can work together, the more that we can support each other. Great, thank you so much, Heather. Well, this has been a fantastic panel. It's been wonderful to be a part of this group and, and to be able to moderate this event. I'm going to turn it over to Heather Horbert again and uh, she can close for us. Thank you so much, Laura. You know, this is um, normally the part of the event where I say thank you to the attendees and panelists for coming, but that, that doesn't really feel like quite enough for the depth of the conversation we've just had and the extremely high quality of the real talk and life advice that's just been dished out. Um, so I think what I actually want to do instead is to take about five more minutes and see if we can get some crosstalk among any of our um, honorees. So if anybody heard something from another honoree that you really want to jump in on or that reminded you of um, something else you want to offer to the folks who are listening, um, please put your video back on and we'll just pop around and get, um, get a couple more nuggets of wisdom from, from each of you on the way out. I, I know some of you all have got more to say.
someone doesn't pop their video on, I might start asking questions. Okay, so now I'm going to make good on that threat. Um, you know, both Heather, aha. Okay, Alex Chandler, um, would you like to come on video and say, um, well, okay, so I was going to ask Alex McCargo and Heather to come back on comments that you made sort of at the start and the end of this. Um, with the idea that of this connection between the, the, the who and the what, which is something we talk about in a more academic way here at New America, how, how bringing more identities and more full and open identities into the space can help us change what we do and what our country does. So can I ask each of you maybe from your different perspectives to say a couple more words about about what, how we, how we get from the changing the who to changing the what. And please feel free to just unmute yourself and go. So I think, and, and a lot of the other um, folks that have spoken today have talked a little bit about that inclusivity, right? And the feeling of being able to come out and, and bring your whole identity to work and all these other things that we mentioned. So I think as far as the, the how and the, the ways to, to kind of see that is, is people, I, when looking for jobs or opportunities or anything else, people do that by looking to see if they see themselves in an organization, right? And that's part of what I think then allows people to feel comfortable and even you know applying or any other part of that. So I, I think there is a continuation of forums like this and spaces like this, I think, the more others are able to see themselves in organizations and spaces, the more people feel comfortable to really in interject their personalities and their personhoods in spaces. And then subsequently, right, that's the snowball effect because we get more diversity because they're bringing equally intersectional personalities or equally, you know, unique people to the to the table. So that's, I mean, love to hear what you have to say, Heather, but that's from, from my perspective, I think that the most immediate way to, to address it, recognizing there's also systemic things that should need to be changed as well. No, I, I definitely agree with that, Alex. And I think what you said in terms of snowball is really important, right? Because it picks up momentum, especially if we see each other and, and we're present in these spaces. Um, you know, I, I think what's really important too is that uh, visibility is obviously vital and, and does start that momentum, but it's not just important to have greater LGBTQI um, representation in these spaces. It's also really important, and this is kind of part of intersectionality and bringing our values here, but to bring queer lenses to our work, right? So this is kind of bringing the who to the how. You don't just bring yourself as a person, but you're also bringing those queer values with you. And what does that mean? It, it might mean kind of disrupting um, the, the status quo a little bit uh, where, where you can. Um, it, it might be bringing values of community that look different than, than what's historically um, been in government. Uh, I think I, I see this a little bit with, with my work. Um, currently, I'm, I'm working as an economic policy advisor in the Secretary's Office of uh, of global women's issues as, as a detailee there. We're working a lot on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected women globally, economically. And, you know, if we had been thinking uh, before, it, it shouldn't have taken a pandemic for us to realize that um, our, our family systems impact our economy and the way that we balance life and work, you know, impacts people's ability to um, to affect policy and, and to be in these spaces. And if we had, you know, kind of brought a, a more feminist lens or a queer lens to what families look like, uh, how women work, how people with marginalized, marginalized identities work, um, we might have kind of superseded this before a pandemic forced our hands to address the issue. Uh, and just to add briefly, because you sparked a thought, right? It's it's showing that those queer voices have value, particularly mm -hmm. ones that have layers, right? I mean, oftentimes a queer lens is seen as being um, white men, white queer men, right? But when I look at diversity, it's not just 
race, gender, you know, sexual orientation. It's socioeconomic background, educational background. There's all those other pieces and perspectives that when put together, I mean, I like to say that the national security arena is one that is diverse and changing, right? The folks on the other side of the fence also don't look like us. So it takes a diverse population of national security executives and, and, and people in the space to be able to accurately um, respond and, and, and know the cultural paradigm, all of those other pieces. And it's no different in the LGBTQIA plus community. It's no different than that. It takes more than just a homogenous, a homogenous view of um, queer identities and national security as well. I think that's that's the beauty in, in, in this new leadership list, right? Is we, we, we all uh, encompass and embody so many different checks of the box or whatever the case may be, but we, we represent the, the larger queer community because it is a homogenous. That's Paul. Yeah, I just actually wanted to, to express my, my support for the new voices list as well, because we've talked, some of us have talked individually about uh, advice that mentors have given us that have helped us navigate uh, tricky situations in our careers, but I have also been somebody who's benefited from leadership from people who are younger and more junior to me throughout my career. And one of those people I was actually on this new voices list, Teresa Kennedy. When I was a, a, an instructor at the US Naval Academy, it was just after the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and I had spent most of my, I had spent all of my naval career at that point in the closet. And as a, as a student at the Naval Academy as well, a, a decade prior, I was certainly in the closet, um, but it was actually seeing students of mine who were very comfortable with their sexuality. And this, you know, this, these are the first students entering the, the service academies after Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, they were sort of, they, they, they created an environment which I felt more comfortable to come out and come to terms with myself in a professional space. And so I just wanted to, to call attention to um, sort of the, the lessons that can be learned from, from people who are even junior to us. And I think that some of us who ha may have, uh, haven't been necessarily comfortable with our sexuality for as long as younger generations. We have a lot to learn uh, from, from the new voices on this list. So thank you for, for including me. Well, as someone who's been in national security so long that when I started in this field, there was really only one identity you could have in the field and all the rest of us were just frantically trying to squeeze into it. Um, this has certainly been a fabulous opportunity for me personally and New America institutionally to learn from younger generations, um, multiple younger generations. So again, I want to congratulate all of you. Thank you for sharing so generously with us. Um, thank our audience, which has been very lively um, throughout this. Um, as Luke Schlissner notes in the chat, um, congratulations to his co-founders at OUT and um, special good luck to Sean Skelly and Gina Ortiz Jones um, as they continue to make history through the confirmation process. And thank you to all of our viewers. Um, and I hope that you will keep track of these fabulous folks and their doings, as well as all the winners on this year's list and the previous list. You can do that by following um, out and following us over over at New America, and um, we look forward to doing this again, and uh, we hope to do it in person.